Ef ich gern ich gebe, ich hat es geht, ich mache, ich fahr alle lau, ich fahr alle lau, bla bla, ich gehe, was ich will. By Robert Louis Stevenson, dramatized in two parts by Chris Dolan. Episode 2. Oh, well, yon was a hot burst. Is it safe to rest? Aye. We'll be fine lying in the heather. I had just seen a gentleman, Colin Campbell of Glenure, struck out of life. Murder done upon the man Alan Breck Stewart hated. And here was I, with Alan, skulking in the trees and running from the troops. Whether his was the hand that fired, or the head that ordered, was of little significance. My only friend in that wild country was blood guilty in the first degree. I held him in horror. Are you still wearied, Davy? You and I must part. I like you very well, Alan, but your ways are not mine and they're not God's. I'll only part company with you, David, without some reason for it. If you can anything against my reputation for old acquaintance sake, let me hear it. Alan, what is the sense in this? You know very well yon Campbell man lies in his blood on the road. I'll tell you first of all, Mr Balfour of Shaws, if I were going to kill a man, I would not be in my own country and bring trouble on my clan. And I would not go wanting sword and gun and with a long fishing rod upon my back. But I swear, my friend, I had nothing to do with this. Will you stand, Alan? And give me your hand. Uh, maybe. But you cast suspicion on me, Davy. You can't blame me after what you told me in the brig. You singled that very man out and said directly you would murder him if you saw the chance. But I know you would not lie to me. I'll no take your hand, sir. But I'll embrace you like a brother. <laughs> <laughs> so, who was the man that did it? Did you see him, the man in the black coat? Black, you say? Ah, it sticks in my head that it was blue. Blue or black? Did you know him? I couldn't conscientiously swear I do. Did you know him or not, Alan? I have a grand memory for forgetting, David. Right, we're safe to walk a while. Keep into the trees. There's one thing I saw clearly. <clears throat> you let yourself be seen to draw the soldiers. I wouldn't any gentleman. To my way of thinking, your morals, Alan, are all tail first. But you're ready to give your life for them. Your whig way of thinking. Whatever. We must flee this country. They'll search the whole of Appen for us both. For my part, for being a Jacobite, for yours because they believe you're involved in the murder of Glen Ure. I have no fear of the justice of my country. As if this was your country. It's the country of the Stuarts. It's all Scotland. Man, a wild's wonder at you. A Campbell has been killed, Davy. It'll be tried in Inverera with Campbells in the jury box and the biggest Campbell of all, the Duke of Argyle, sitting on the bench. Justice. The same justice as Glen Ure found a while ago at the roadside. We're in the healings, Davy. And when I tell you to run, you take my word and run. It's a hard thing to skulk and starve in the heather, but it's harder yet to lie shackled in a red coat prison. Where? Where do we run? The lowlands. My country. I have an itching to see my uncle again. A little matter of trying to sell me as a slave in the Americas when I'm the true Balfour of Shaws. It's no small thing, traversing to the lowlands. You mon lie bare and hard and brook many an empty belly. Your bed shall be the moorcocks and your life shall be like the hunted deers. It's a life I can well. Either take to the heather with me, or else hang. That's a choice very easily made, my friend. And now, let's take another peek at those redcoats. There they are, up and down every hillside. You and me, David, can sit down and take a bite. And a dram. Then we'll strike for Ocharn. We must get my arms and money to carry us along. And then we'll cry, Fourth Fortune! Take a cast among the heather. We made our way to Ocharn, under the cloak of darkness. Over mountainsides, down valleys, I followed Alan blindly. While it was yet night, we came to the top of a brae. There were torches moving below that stopped at Alan's whistle. On the third, they recognised the sign, and they came towards us, 
headed by a handsome man of more than 50 years. Ah, James Stewart. I will ask you to speak in Scotch, for here is a young gentleman with me that is nane of the other. A young gentleman of the lowlands, and a laird in his country too. But I am thinking it will be the better for his health if we give his name the go-by. The lad with a silver button. Good morning to you, sir. This is a dreadful accident. It will bring trouble in the country. Dodd man, you must take the sour with a sweet. Colin Roy is dead. Be thankful for that. And by my truth, I wish he was alive again. Now the deed is done, Alan. Who's to bear the blame of it? The killing was done in Appen, and it's Appen that must pay. And I am a man that has family. You're going to need weapons. We've a pistol or two to spare. Ah, better than we had on the Covenant, eh, Davy? You have your father's sword still, Alan. Here's a of mine for you, lad. Uh, I've never used one. Take it. I'll teach you along the way. You'll need to eat. I've looked out some oatmeal and a pan to cook with and a bottle of right French brandy. Thank you, ma'am. We'll be needing cellar. I've paid our chillers' rents and have but 17 pennies left in my whole fortune. Uh, I have a couple of guineas left. Oh, well, that won't see us far. This is all we have. Three shillings and a halfpenny. Thank you. Well, you're a steward through and through, Lishbull. And now, you must be on the move. If they find you, Alan, and blame you, then it'll fall on us, since we harboured you. I have no choice, Alan. I'll have to pay for you. What does that mean? James will have to offer a reward for our capture. It's a sore thing to do between sick close friends. Aye, but it'd be painful too if I was to hang. So, you need to be clear of what happened. Mayor, clear of Scotland. And I'll have to paper your friend from the lowlands. Me? Oh, this is Uncle Hard on the lad. Look things in the face, man. The Campbells have seen him. But they do not know my name. And what of it? They can your habit in your face. They think you were in league with a murderer. Then I say this. The plain common sense is to set the blame where it belongs. And that is on the man who fired the shot. Paper him, as you call it, and let honest, innocent folk show their faces in safety. Have you gone mad? <laughs> He's a lowlander, James, and a Whig. He understands nothing of the healings. Very well, then. Paper me, as you call it. Paper Alan. Paper King George. We're all three innocent, and that seems to be what's wanted. James has no choice, Davy. Daylight is upon us. Oh, there'll be a terrible to-do in Appen. A fine riding of dragoons, crying of crooken, running of redcoats. That behoves you and me to the sooner be gone. Sometimes we walked, sometimes we ran, we seldom stopped. Where we were, or in which direction we traversed, I have little notion. We slept soundly from exhaustion, in the bracken, near running water. With the first peep of morning, I saw where we had landed. Why is this place? Glencoe. Where the massacre was. This is no place for you and me. A place they're bound to watch. We need to cross that waterfall. Cross it? How? Jump over. Oh, darling, I can't. Here. A sip of brandy. Then follow me. Oh. One. Three. Hang on to the I can't. You see? Easy! I can't, I'm afraid! At the count of three, Davy! One! Come on, Davy! Two! What choice have ye? Three! Ah! <laughs> well done, Davy, lad! I'm slipping! Help me! No more! I've uh, got you! I've got you! Clamber up! I'm slipping! You're fine! Climb! Uh, 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 <laughs> I near died. <laughs> oh, you're no very glad at the jumping. I am not. Small blame to you. To be afraid of a thing and still to do it. It's what makes the prettiest kind of man. I knew, of course, that the highlands of my country are mountainous. But never did I suspect they lived up so truly to their name. We were high, then we were low, then higher again than I thought possible. For sustenance, we made do generally with dramach, not but oatmeal mingled with cold stream water. But it makes a good enough dish for a hungry man. 
We set up yet another steep slope, along ridges, so that it seemed to me we were walking on clouds. Alan taught me how to guddle for trout. The pair of us stripped and groping about in the water till we caught one. Sometimes we skirted so close to the redcoats that we could hear them speak from over a hillock or a dry stained dike. Their English speech astonished me. I barely understood it and indeed have never yet grown used to it as perhaps a very critical eye might spy out in these very memoirs. We slept in caves, heather bushes, under stars and in the cold. We're safe a while. This is a good spot. Draw your sword, David Balfour, a shot. Do what? I'll learn you. Todd Atlan, am I not wearied enough with the walking and climbing and swimming and running? And you'll be wearier yet. Take up your blade. Position yourself like I do. Right. Look, tack tent, man. I'm no skilled. And there's one fashion of learning in my experience. Defending yourself. Come on, David. Get your feet like mine. Right. Right in front, left behind. Okay, I'm coming for your heat. Get that guard up. We'll have hot porridge tonight, Davy, to help set our minds. To what? Well, this is how we stand. South, it's all Campbells. And north, well, there's no muckle to be gained ganging north. Neither for you that wants to get to Queensferry, nor yet me that wants to get to France. Alan, do not take me wrong. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be safer if we parted company? Oh. You tired of my company, Mr. Balfour? Uh, no. <laughs> You're a pretty lad, Davy. But you wouldn't endure a day, let alone a night, without me. Then east. Ah, well, uh, east, you see, it's mere pitch and toss out on yon bald, naked place. Redcoats can spy you a mile away. Then what? With little money and low on meal? It's all a risk. And I give my word to go ahead until I drop. There are whiles when you're altogether too fuggish for a gentleman like me. But other whiles you show a metal spark. And it's in, David. I love you like a brother. <laughs> <laughs> then came the night of my weakness. It was my turn to take watch. We had no clock to go by. Alan had stuck a sprig of heath in the ground to serve instead. I fell asleep, woke, and looked at that stick of heath. Oh no. I could have cried aloud, for I saw by its shadow that I had betrayed my trust. Sure enough, a body of horse soldiers had drawn close to us and were drawing nearer. Alan! <coughs> Aye. Is it time to step on? Shh! It's my fault! Come see! Troth. Redcoats. I'm sorry. What are we to do? Play at being hares. You see Ben Alder? Let us strike for that. It's a wild mountain full of hollows. If we can win it before the sun rises any higher. But that'll take us across the very coming of the soldiers. I can that. But if we're driven back to Appen, we're two dead men. So now, Davy, man, be brisk. Oh, never make it! The moment he was out in the open, Alan fell to his hands and knees and scrambled with an incredible quickness, as though it were his natural way of going. I tried to do the same. It's an employ that brings an overmastering weariness. The half troop had not spied us yet. They were spread out over about two miles of ground and beating it mightily as they went. Over there. Then down round that hammock. If I can. That's them. Cried off for the night. Oh, we made it. Alan, am I a danger to you? You'd be justified to think you'd be safer on your own. Troth, Davy. We've travelled hard and far. It was just as like I slept through a watch. We'll say no more about it. Onwards, brother. But now? Well, there shall be no rest the night. But Alan... These dragoons of yours will keep to the crown of the Muirland. We got through in the nick of time, shall we? Jeopard what we've gained. It's not for the want of will. 
If I could, I would. But sure as I am alive, I cannot. <sighs> I'll carry you. <sighs> Lead away. I'll follow. Aye, <laughs> we'll make a healing man of you yet. Hey, Johnny Cole, for you walking yet. You jag your by my name. At the time, I smiled at Alan's offer to carry me. He was near a foot shorter than me. All the same, there may have been some sense in it. My weariness did not leave me. Indeed, I began to sicken, though I was loath to tell my companion in arms of my condition. Tashinya Onoroch. So I was relieved that we had reached the reside of a co-conspirator of Alan's. Smish Alan Breg Stuart. Alan G. Betjeson Tysha His name was Clooney McPherson, chief of Clan Vurach, one of the leaders of the Great Rebellion six years before. Never in all my life had I seen such a strange dwelling, and never will again. I thought at first my sickness was making me see things, but there it was, Clooney's cage. The trunks of several trees had been wattled across, strengthened through the latitude with stakes. A rowan tree growing out from the hillside was the living centre beam. The hole leaned on the steep hillside thicket like a wasp's nest in a green hawthorn. Come along, bring in your friend that as yet I didn't ken the name of, the Laird of Shaws, Mr David Balfour. I'm proud to acquaint you, sir, and apologise for my ignorance of your tongue and for my state. <laughs> Alan, I'm so fatigued. May I sit? If this abode is grand enough for a certain king, whose name your travelling companion bears, then I trust it be good enough for a laird. Lie you down in yon hammock, the very one that King Charlie himself slept snug. But first, you'll need to eat. That's the cause of your complaint, I don't doubt. Or a beer, Garhoyan. Clooney had assembled around him a band of rough Highland fighters who obeyed his every order despite the coarse and haughty manner with which he spoke to them. The collops he served looked fine and hearty, but I did not have the strength to raise more than a spoonful or two to my lips. To the restoration. To the king. To the king across the sea. I took to my bed as soon as I was able. I cannot tell you whether I slept or daydreamed. Whatever illness was upon me robbed me of any sense of passing time. Do you like the carts, Alan Brick? Oh, I've been known to win a hand or two. They're a fine way of passing the long nights for fugitives like us marooned out in the hills. Mr Balfour, will you rise from your cot and join us at the table? I have neither the vigour nor the will, if I'm to be honest with you, sir. My father taught me playing cards was not a Christian or gentlemanly pursuit. What kind of whiggish canting talk is this? For the house of Clooney McPherson? Ach, now, Clooney. I would put my hand in the fire for Davy Balfour. He's an honest and metal gentleman. Hmm. In this poor house of mine, any man may follow his pleasure. Right. Set the cards out for two. Oi. Ah. Oi. It seemed to me that the two Highlanders played at their cards for days on end, though perhaps it was the course of a single night. I have a mind that I woke from time to time and saw them bent over the table hard at work with their cards. And I saw, it seemed a vision, a great glittering pile of golden guineas between them. It seemed too that Alan was having the best of it, but still I thought it deep water for my friend to be riding. And... As I was soon to learn, oh, fortune terrible. turned against him. Shoot. Davy. Davy, lad. I woke in a sweat, Alan's face close to my own, the flame of the fire burning in his eyes. Lend me your money. What for? Hat, David. You wouldn't grudge me alone. Take it. My coat there... I need to... to sleep. Uh, 
Enough now, man. We'll break her fast. One more. One more hand. Dodman, deal. One. Whether it was the second or the third day since I'd laid my bones down, I do not know. But finally I awoke with a great relief of spirits. Still weak and weary, but seeing things with their everyday honest appearance. Ah. Oh. <sighs> How long have I slept? Uh, we're done here. Have you the strength to go, David? Uh, I don't know if I'm as well as I should be. I'll be better after we've taken the road and I've breathed some air. Aye. We'll proceed now. But we have a new difficulty. What is it? We have no money. I've lost it. There's the truth of it. My money too? Your money too. You shouldn't have given it to me. I'm daft when I get to the carts. Alan, that money was to carry us a long way. You lost it all to Cluny. Hut, hut. It was all doffing. You'll have your money back. It would be a singular thing for me to keep it. Alan? Will you step to the door with me, Mr. Cluny? First, sir. I must acknowledge your generosity. What generosity? What would you have me do, boxed up in this cage? Carts are entertainment when a friend passes by. And if they lose, well, it's not to be supposed that I would take their money. So if they lose, you give them back their money, and if they win, they carry yours away in their pouches. Hmm. I am a young man. I ask your advice like I were your own son. My friend lost my money fairly. Can I accept it back again? Would that be the right part for me to play? You can see it is hard upon a man of any pride. Ah, uh, now you're making it hard on me. You denounced me earlier, sir, for my refusal to play, but now you see, there is something to be said upon my side. This gambling is a very poor employ. Mr. Balfour, I think you are too nice and covenanting. But for all that... You have the spirit of a very pretty gentleman. My advice, you may take this money. That is what I would tell my son. And here's my hand along with it. You would like to know our route? We're on Loch Rannoch now. Bonnie, no? If you tire of rowing, I'll take my turn. Have you ever rowed a boat before, Davy? It doesn't look a particularly troublesome task. Well, once you get the gist of it. We'll lay Clooney's skiff off at the head of the loch. And then we'll mark our way through Glen Lyon and Glen Lochy. What think you, Davy? And then, from Glen Dockert. Come down into the lowlands by Kippen. Not that it's the prettiest of routes for me. We're heading straight for Glenorchy Campbell's. My blood foes. Hmm? What was that, Davy? Didn't he hear you? Eh? Davy. David. Uh, have it your own way. For long, we said nothing, marching alongside or behind one another, each with a set countenance. I, angry and proud, and drawing strength from those two violent and sinful feelings. Alan, angry and ashamed, ashamed that he had gambled my money, and angry that I should take it so ill. David! This is no way for two friends to take a small accident. I have to say that I'm sorry. So that said, now if you have anything, you'd better say it. No, I have nothing. Oh, even when I admit I am to blame. Oh, why, of course, you are to blame. And you will bear me out that I have not reproached you. No, but you've done worse. Are we to part, David Balfour? You recommended it once before. I'm not so keen to bite where I'm not wanted. Alan Breck, it's true. I fell asleep upon the muir and put us in danger. It was from weariness. 
You do wrong to cast it up to me. Which is what I never did. I have never yet failed a friend knowingly, and it's not likely I'll start with you. There are things between us I can never forget, even if you can. I will only say this to you, David. I have long been owing you my life, and now I owe you money. You should try and make that burden light for me. I never named a thing until you did. You should think more of others, Alan Brake Stewart, and speak less about yourself. And when a friend who likes you very well has passed over an offence without a word, you would be blind to let it lie. Ah, oh, we'll say no more. In my own defence, I can only say that I was not fully recuperated from whatever it was that ailed me at Clooney's and before. I draw too on my youth. I was but a lad, weeks out of his home, just seventeen years. We traversed for the best part of three nights and three days on eerie mountains, often buried in mist, blown and rained upon, and not once cheered by any glimpse of sunshine. A fire was never to be thought of. I was never warm, and my teeth chattered. I began to understand the story of the water kelpie, that demon of the streams who wails and roars all night for the coming of the doomed traveller. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. I saw that Alan felt the superstition too, for I was shocked to see him cross himself in the manner of the Catholics. During all these horrible wanderings, we had no familiarity. The truth is, I was sickening for my grave. I was, I saw, of an unforgiving disposition all my life. Slow to take offence, slower to forget it. I was nursing my anger, and that only added to my exhaustion. You'd better let me take your pack. I'd do very well, thank you. I'll no offer it again. I'm not a patient man, David. I never said you were. Come on, wiggy boy, jump. I mind you're no very glad at the jumping, but this is just a wee burning. Up, my wiggy laddie. <laughs> And thank you for your encouragement, sir. Mr. Stewart, you are older than I am, and you should know your manners. You think it wise and witty to cast my politics in my teeth. <laughs> oh, oh. Hey, Johnny Cole, are you walking yet? <sighs> and are your drums are beating yet? Oh, why do you insist on singing a rebel anthem, sir, now that your Jacobites and your failed leader have been roundly defeated twice? David, you shall henceforth speak civilly of my king and my people. I'm a Stuart. Oh, I can find you bear a king's name. Well, since I have been in the Highlands, sir, I have seen many who bear that name. And I can say this. They would be none the worse of a washing. You affront me further. Oh, and I am not done. Both Wigs and Campbells have beaten you. You have run before them like a hare. It behoves you to speak of them as your betters. Well, this is a pity. There are things said that cannot be passed over. I am as ready as you. Ready? I am no blower and bolster like some I could name. Come on! Fall to! David, are you daft? I cannot draw upon ye. It's fair murder. How was your lookout when you insulted me? It's the bare truth, laddie. Uh, you're not even standing right, like a torchy. Come at me! Nah. <laughs> nah. I can't. Uh. Alan. Forgive me. If you not kill me, then let me alone to die. Man, oh man, baby <laughs> lad. It's true. I'm by with it. I'm finished. Can you walk? No. These last hours, my legs have been fainting under me. I can't breathe right. If I die, you'll forgive me, Alan. In my heart, you can. I loved you fine, even when I was angriest. Weeshed, man, weeshed. Then I say that. Don't, David, you can how I feel. <laughs> Let me get my arm about you. That's uh, the way. Uh, now, lean upon me hard. Uh, I'll try. Do you gang easier so, Davy? Aye. 
I can be going this way. Uh. Davy, I'm not a right man at all. I've neither sense nor kindness. You're just a bairn. Couldn't I see you were dying on your feet? Ah, oh, Davy, you'll have to try and forgive me. Neither one of us to mend the other, Alan. A house. But you need a proper house. A roof over your head. Out of this deluge. Warm food. Oh, it's too dangerous. I'll keep you safe. I have friends. Not so far away. I'm a poor man. Will you not be better on my back? Oh, oh, I'm near 12 inches taller. You're no such thing. Maybe a matter of an inch or two. I'm not saying I'm just exactly what you would call a tall man. Oh, you're tall enough, Alan. Well, now I come to think of it, I dare say you'll be just about right. Aye, it'll be a foot between us. Maybe even more. Uh, Alan, what makes you so good to me? What makes you care for such a thankless fellow? Indeed, I didn't again. For just precisely what I thought I liked about you was, you never quarrel. And now that you have, I like you better. <laughs> Alan all but carried me for I don't know how many miles, through rain and fog and mud. I have little memory of arriving, only truly of the moment I was laid in a warm, comfortable bed with blankets and a pillow. I learned later that I was in the house of Duncan Do McLaren, where Alan Breck and, by extension, myself were welcome. I have a faint recall of a doctor being fetched, and who found me in a sorry plight. I lay in that bed for nigh on a month, July well into August. For his part, Alan had to hide in the woods, as vulnerable as ever to the rain and wind and biting midges. Yet he refused to continue his escape, though his life was at peril. He visited me every day against all advice. Also astonishing was that no magistrate came for either of us. My presence was known to all in Baokoheda. There were visitors aplenty in Duncan Dew's house. Other folk keep a secret among two or three near friends, and still it leaks out in a flash. But among these clansmen, it is told to the whole country, and they keep it for a century. Come in, Alan. Look you here, Davy. The bill they've posted all over the Heelands looking for us. Man, it's strange. Like looking in a mirror. Ah, and see how I'm advertised. A small... Uh, didn't you laugh now, Davy? <laughs> a small, active man of 35 or thereby, mm -hmm. dressed in a feathered hat, Aye. a French side coat, uh -huh, of blue with silver buttons, yeah. and lace a great deal tarnished. Mm. A red waistcoat and breeches of black shag. And I, a tall, strong lad of about 18, wearing an old blue coat, very ragged, an old Highland bonnet, a long homespun waistcoat, blue breeches, legs bare, mm -hmm. low country shoes, what in the toes? <laughs> Speaks like a lowlander and has no beard. <laughs> no so tall. Well, you'll leave here looking a different fella. Duncan do his clothes put by for you. And you should change yours too, Alan, for your safety. Ah, troth. A fine sight I would be, eh, if I went back to France in an old bonnet and a hodded shirt. <laughs> Have you music, Alan Brake, as folks say? Aye, I can blow you a ditty, Duncan Do. <laughs> oh, you're a bonny gentleman, right enough. Bring Mr Stewart the pipes. On one of my last nights at Duncan Do McLaren's, I was well rested and was sat up by the fire, as if at a Cayley with a glass of small beer. And I discovered that my friend truly did possess a talent I had mean-spiritedly thought him only to have invented. I can do you, McCrimmon. To this day, I can still hear the sad beauty of Alan Breck Stewart's pipes playing that evening. The 
Once mayor, we two pretty gentlemen tack to the road. We started out again in beautiful warm weather, which stayed with us. There was every sign of an early and great harvest. It's a chief principle in military affairs to go where you least expect it. Wherever fourth is our trouble. You can the saying, Davy, the fourth bridles the wild healing man. If we seek to creep round its head and come down by Kippen or Balfron, well, it's just precisely there they'll be looking to lay hands on us. Kippen? Balfron? These are names I know. Oh, you're in your own land again, Davy. For we've just passed the healing line. And if we cross the fourth, we might cast our bonnets in the air. To that end, if we stave on straight to the old brig of Stirling, I'll lay my sword will pass unchallenged. Lead on, my friend. We walked over bonny low hills and through meadows. We lay to sleep in the heather bush within view of a herd of deer. The happiest awakening, breathing in sunshine and on bone-dry ground that I have ever tasted. We struck Allen Water and looked down over the cars of Stirling, the town and castle in the midst of it. At last we came to the bridge of Stirling, the very door of our salvation. I almost ran across with a shout, but Alan held me back. Wait, watch. Oh, George, son. Boy, watch. This'll never do. This'll never, never do for us. So what now? We'll have to see what we can do further downstream. There are fords on the river, but none on the farth, Alan. And a bridge forby, and of what service when they're watched. Oh, a river can be swum. Well, neither you nor me has much of a hand at that exercise. There's such a thing as a boat. And there's such a thing as money. We have neither ain or the other. David, you're a man of small invention and less faith. Let me set my wits on it. See if I can beg, borrow, nor yet steal a boat. Let Alan Breck think for ye. Put your arm around me. For why? We're going to the small chain shop there in Lankilns. We've little money. We'll buy nothing. Like I tell you, let me do the thinking. Now, put your arms around me, like you were on your last legs. Uh, That's it. Well, come on, put your heart into it, man. Once you're looking bleary in the death's doorstep. Like this. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, come on. It's no laughing matter. Let's go. Help us, lassie. A tassa brandy to revive him. What's wrong with him? Wrong? He's walked more hundreds of miles than he has hairs on his chin, sleeping only in wet heather. He's young for the like of that. Our young. Brandy, please. He'd be better riding. And where could I get a horse to him? Would you have me steal? Drink, son. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And thank you, miss. Has he any friends? Well, that he has so. If we could win to them. Rich friends. A bed to lie in, food to eat, and a doctor to see to him. Then, why don't you go there? They're all across the water there. I can't wheel safely say, but I'll whistle you a tune. <gasps> Whisht! Jacobites! And him so young. Poor lamb. But don't worry. I will not betray you. I can see you're not that kind. But could you help? No. No. I couldn't. If we had the use of a boat to pass under the cloud of night into Lothian... Aye, but no. Shall he go wanting, lassie? Are you to lie in your warm bed and think upon us when the wind growls in the chimney and the rain turls on your roof? Are you to eat your meat by the fire and think upon this poor sick lad, blue we called in hunger, with a death grapple in his throat? Oh, Lord, stop. <laughs> Did you ever hear, miss, of Mr. Rankeeler of the ferry? Rankeeler the lawyer? Yeah, it's to his door, I'm bound. Rankeeler's a Kent man. So you may judge by that if I'm an ill doer. I tell you, miss, though I am by some dreadful errors and peril of my life, King George has no truer friend in all Scotland than myself. <coughs> Aye. Will, uh, listen, will you help us, lassie? Aye. I'll find some means to put you over. You, you came to rescue us yourself, miss. I thought it best to trust nobody. I could tell you were a wise lass. Not even your sweetheart. And who says I have one? You're looking a wee bitty better, young sir. Oh, only because of the hope you have given me. As soon as my father was asleep, 
I stole our neighbour's boat. <laughs> Bold and wise. We cannot thank you enough. You can, by holding your wished. It was you yourself said there are guards about. So here you are. Cross the fourth. Then it is time to throw our bonnets. Or rather, I'll throw mine. You may propel your fine French hat, threadbare though it be. Huh? Then let's do it. God save the king! Cross the sea! <laughs> now you, my friend, must make haste to see your man Rankiller and reclaim your fortune. Now that I'm within sight, I think that may prove more difficult than I had thought. You'll come with me, Alan. What? And be arrested and hanged? As will you be if you're seen with me. I shall hide out of Queensferry. Just here is bra. When you've resolved your business, I'm sure happily, come back for me. Whistle. I'll see you soon, Alan Breck Stewart. <sighs> Aye. What will be, will be. Immortalis. I open my door and there's a ragged laddie. Forgive me and my appearance. I'm looking for a Mr. Rankeela. By a rather singular chance, or perhaps not as this is my house, I am that very man. Then, sir, may I beg the favour of an interview? I do not know your name, nor yet your face. Though I have the smallest of inklings. My name is David Balfour. <laughs> My inklings are as trustworthy as ever. And where have you come from, Mr. David Balfour? From a great many strange places, sir. <laughs> Nec gemino bellum Trojanum ordetur ab ovo. Do you understand that? I will do as Horace says, sir, and be as brief as I can. I have reason to believe myself some rights on the estate of Shaw's. Oh, do you know? <laughs> <clears throat> Where and when were you born? In Essendine, the year 1733, the 12th of March. Your father and mother? My father was Alexander Balfour, schoolmaster, and my mother was Grace Petterow. Have you any papers proving your identity? Uh, no, sir. They are in the hands of Mr Campbell, the minister at Essendine. For that matter, I don't think my uncle would deny me. Uh, Mr Ebenezer Balfour? The same. Did you ever meet a man of the name of Hoseason? I did, sir, for my sins. I was on my way to this very house when I was trepanned on board his brig, a plan devised by my uncle and executed by Hoseason. I was struck down, thrown below, and was destined for the plantations, a fate that I escaped by being shipwrecked. Where? Off the Isle of Mull. Well, so far, I may tell you, this agrees pretty exactly with other informations that I hold. The Covenant was lost on June the 27th, and we are now at August the 24th. That is a considerable hiatus, Mr Balfour. Before I tell all my story, I would be glad to know that I was talking to a friend. <laughs> Fui non sum. You are thinking I am your uncle's man of business. But while you, Imberbus Juvenus Custode Remoto, were gallivanting in the west, a good deal of water has run under the bridges. On the very day of your sea disaster, you and Mr Campbell stalked into my office, demanding to know of your whereabouts. Mr Ebenezer admitted having seen you. He declared, indeed, though it seemed to me improbable, that he had given you considerable sums and that you had started for Europe, intending to fulfil your education. Some weeks later comes Captain Hallseason with the story of your drowning. <laughs> Mr Balfour, you can judge for yourself to what extent I may be trusted. Thank you for your confidence, Mr Rankila. Sir, if I tell you my story, I must commit a friend's life to your discretion. Uh, I would name no unnecessary names, Mr Balfour. <laughs> Above all of Highlanders. A certain name has rung through Scotland of late with the news of the app and murder of Colin Roy of Glen Ewan. Oh, I swear that my friend Alan... Uh, let us call your friend, if you please, Mr Thompson. Oh. 
A man, I have an inkling, will prove an embarrassment. But I have no doubt that you have your reasons to adhere to him. I told Mr. Rankeeler my entire story. The lawyer was kind enough once I had ended to allow me to wash and to find clothes of his sons to replace my tattered rags. And then I sat at my first proper dinner table since I had left home, what now seemed a lifetime ago. You will be wondering, no doubt, about your father and your uncle. Mm. To be sure, there's a singular tale. A love affair, no less. A what? My uncle Ebenezer. Your uncle, Mr David, was not always old. And, what may surprise you, not always ugly. <laughs> Ebenezer had a spirit of his own that seemed to promise great things in the future. In 1715, what did he do but run away and join the rebels? Thankfully, your father pursued him and brought him back. However, Mayora Kanamas, the two lads fell in love. And with the same lady. Good Lord. Mm. Ebenezer was the spoiled one and was sure of his victory. When he found he had lost out to his older brother, he screamed like a peacock. He <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rode from public house to public house and shouted his sorrows into the lug of any Tom, Dick and Harry. Your father, Mr David, was a kind gentleman. Too kind. For one day he resigned the lady. She was no such fool, however. It's from her you must inherit your good sense. We are talking here about my mother. Your father and uncle came to a bargain. One man took the lady, the other the estate. An arrangement that has brought forth a monstrous family of injustices. Your father and mother lived and died poor folk. And you were reared in poverty. While my uncle stole the entire estate. Ah, but what a time for Mr Ebenezer. Those who knew the truth gave him the cold shoulder. Those who knew it not, seeing one brother disappear and the other succeed in the estate, raised a cry of murder. Money was all he got by his bargain. And in all this, what is my position? The estate is yours, beyond a doubt. It matters nothing what your father signed. You are the heir of entail. But your uncle is a man to fight the indefensible. A lawsuit is expensive, David. And if any of your doings with your friend, Mr Thompson, were to come out, we might find that we had burned our fingers. The kidnapping, to be sure, would be a court card upon our side, if we could have a confession of it. Perhaps I've learnt at my friend Mr Thompson's side, for I have the beginnings of a plan. I've asked Alan, Mr. Thompson, to meet us outside my uncle's. There he is. Over here. Oh, it's a trouble to your shawls, Davy lad. This is Mr. Rankeeler. I've heard all about you, sir. Uh, Mr. Thompson, I'm pleased to meet you. Uh, I'm afraid I have forgotten my glasses, and I'm a little better than blind, so that you must not be surprised if I pass you by tomorrow. <laughs> Aye, David told me about you and your lawyer's wiles. You do not know me, sir. And I thank you heartily for your continued assistance to Mr Balfour here. Et obimus, gentlemen. Mr Rankeeler and I shall watch from precisely this point. You ready to join battle with Ebenezer, Alan? Fourth fortune. This is no kind of time of nick for decent folk. Where are you? And what brings you here? I have a blunderbush. Is that yourself, Mr Balfour? My business concerns David Balfour. I better let you in. Ah, but would I enter? I will tell you what I'm thinking. It is here upon this doorstep that we must confer upon this business. David, you see. Well... What must, must. Mind, I have my blunder bush. A step nearer, you're as good as deed. A very civil speech. I will 
as is no a very chanty kind of a proceeding. Where are you? My name is no business in my story. The highland country of my friends is not very far from the Isle of Mull, of which you will have heard. Aye. Uh-huh. Hurry up. There was a ship lost in those parts, and the next day a gentleman of my acquaintance came upon a lad that was half drowned. Half drowned, you see? Aye. He brought him to, and he clapped him in an old ruined castle, where from that day to this he has been a great expense to my friends. These friends discovered that the lad was your born nephew, Mr. Balfour. They asked me to give you a call and confer upon the matter. A strange tale, but I'm no very interested in it. He was not a good lad to the best of it. I'll pay any ransom if that's what your friends are after. Oh, I feared it might come to this. He didn't want the lad back. Well, what do you want done with him, and how much will you pay? Pay? Oh, come, sir. Either give me an answer, or by the top of Glencoe, I will ram three feet of iron through your vitals. Hoot, toot, toot. Give me a minute. I'm just a plain man and need dancing, master. Your own wild talk, it's fair disreputable. Vitals, says you. And what about my blunder bush? Oh, before your jottering finger could find the trigger, my hilt would diddle on your breast bane. Do you want the lad killed or kept? Killed? Killed, you say? Oh, that's neat kind of language. Killed or kept? <laughs> Keep it. Keep it. We'll have nae bloodshed. Good. As you please. But well, that'll be the dearer. Dearer? Well, killing's easier and quicker and surer, but if you want a price, I would first have to ken what you gave O season. O season? What for? For kidnapping David. Oh, it's a lee. It's a black lee. Did O season tell you? I know O season. You drove a fool's bargain when you let that sailor man so far forward in your private matters. Well, the solemn God's truth is this. I gave the captain twenty pound. But that was to have the selling of the lad in Caroliney. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. That will do excellently well. Thank you. Good evening, Uncle. Davy. That's a brunecht, eh, for a family reunion. With the confession recorded, an agreement was easy made. I was to be provided with two-thirds of the Balfour estate income for so long as my uncle should live. Thereafter, Shaw's would revert entirely to me. We all of us slept the remainder of the night at what would be eventually my new home. In the morning, Alan and I returned to Edinburgh, where we bid farewell and thanks to Mr Rankeeler. I then had to present myself at the bank to undertake the necessary paperwork and where I financed passage for one on a boat for France. That business concluded, Alan and I made our way to the port where soon we would have to part company. Come on then, Mr Balfour O'Shaws. Uh, Let's see if being landed to gentry makes you any better effect. Oh, uh, no, nah, I didn't like to take advantage of sick a wee man. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh the burn's toughened up when it's too oh. late. And all our adventure's over. We had some times, Alan, didn't we? And some close scrapes. Fighting off a whole crew of tarry sailors. Half the red coats of Scotland. Risking our necks every day. Ah, there are worse things in the world than to be hanged. <laughs> Not so many. <laughs> <laughs> Our last walk together, after so many hills and mountains and riverbanks and dangers. Though we tried, neither of us had much heart to talk. The same thought was uppermost in both, that we were near the time of our parting, and remembrance of all the bygone days sat upon us sorely. We got near to Castorfin Bogs and looked over to the castle on the hill. We stopped for we both knew that we had come to where our ways must finally part. Hey, Johnny Cope, are you walking yet? You jack no, a by are name, beating yet. you shall hear, hey, Johnny Cope, you shall you hear. Walking yet? You jack no, a bite by name, beating you yet. shall hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, goodbye, Alan Breck Stewart. Goodbye, David Balfour of Shaws. Here's my hand. I will only take your hand, Davy. I'll embrace you like the brother you are. 
You take care of yourself, laddie. And you take care in France. We'll meet again, us fine, pretty gentlemen. And he went off down the hill, towards the river. You who bears a king's name. I did not glance back, for I could not. I know not whether Alan did. I felt so lost and lonesome without my friend that I could have found it in my heart to sit down by the dike and weep like any baby. Ye Jacobites by name, lend an ear, lend an ear. Ye Jacobites by name, lend an ear. Ye Jacobites by name, your thoughts I will proclaim. Your doctrines I am blame, ye shall hear, ye shall hear. Your doctrines I am blame, ye shall hear. In Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson, dramatised by Chris Dolan, David Balfour was played by Owen Whitelaw, Alan Breck by Michael Nardoni, Ebenezer, David Heyman, Ryan Keeler, John Buick, James Stewart, Finlay MacLean, Clooney McPherson, Ian McRae, and The Lass by Isabel Joss. Other parts were played by the cast. Kidnapped was a BBC Scotland production directed in Glasgow by Bruce Young. <laughs>